Tonight on SIP episode 127, we answer the question, how does a celebrity get into the wine business? Answer, pick a family that's a fourth generation family that's producing some of the finest grapes for many of the best wineries in all of Napa and partner with them. We're joined by Ryan Hill and Bree Garcia, formerly one half of the Bella Twins, as she and sister Nikki enter into the wine business, producing some fantastic wines with Ryan out of Napa Valley. Let's jump right in. It is a wild ride this evening. Uh, Alyssa is first. And Alyssa, I've got special news for you. Doug, coming from Seattle. Hans and Caitlin, Jeff and Jane. Jeff and Jane are in Shenandoah National Park in a trailer. What could go wrong? I'm sensing a hurricane, tornado, or some hail. Jim B is in the house. Julie's in the house. Kristen, Lynn, Michelle, Raquel, Peter, Sandy. Haven't seen you in a while. Welcome. Uh, this is SIP episode 127. And for those of you that are joining for the first time, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Martin Cody, co-founder of Cellar Angels. Cellar Angels is a direct-to-consumer wine company that we started in 2010. And we started it to change wine. And why did we do that? Because great wine and great wine people change us. And it gives us a great pleasure to introduce two of them to you this evening. But before I do that, I want to show you a very famous hill. Now, there are some famous hills in wine country. There's one called Pritchard. Right outside downtown San Francisco, there's Knob. In Boston, there's Bunker. But the hill that I'm referring to is, in fact, Hill Hermitage in Burgundy. Actually, it's in the Rhone. But here I am standing atop the Hermitage Hill, which many of you have had teaching courses from us back in the store when we owned a retail shop. You can see the Rhone River down here. Uh, it was a little chilly up there at 10 o'clock in the morning, but never too early to drink wine in the Rhone on top of Hermitage. It did not stink. I actually shared the wrong picture with you, so I will share another one uh, because this gives you a vantage point of just looking over to the right, and you can see these terraced vineyards that have been farmed for a century and or more, I mean, hundreds of years, you've got the Rhone River down here. Our riverboat was parked right over here. You're looking up at uh, El Tain Hermitage across the river, another wine growing region. I highly encourage you to get to the Rhone Valley, north and south, uh, because it's a magical, magical place. There are other magical places on the Cellar Angels tour. And for those of you drinking the wines with us this evening, you got them because you purchased a sip kit. Now, the SIP kit is something we put together to introduce you to famous wine people that are doing extraordinary things. And you can just go to the Cellar Angels website, click on Shop Wine, and you will be brought right to the wine marketplace. And here you can see the SIP kit for events from May 12th through June 30th. There's a lot of great wines coming up, including a sparkler, which I'm always happy to see. Uh, and tonight we're going to be looking and going deep on a dive with Hill Family Estates and Ryan Hill. And our newest best friend, Brie Garcia from Bonita Bonita, one half of a duo that is really kind of taking the wine industry by storm. And they know a few things about uh, wrestling uh, top spots and placements and getting things done. So we'll get into that. Uh, and without actually much further ado, I'm going to have them come out of the green room, which we've been spoiling them with M&Ms and lobster and turn their cameras on. Because we get to visit with an old friend, Ryan Hill, and a new friend, Brie Garcia. Welcome. Hello, Shipsters. If I like, you should say bonjour. Yes. <laughs> bonjour. Uh, a funny story, Brie, about my French pronunciation. Mm -hmm. uh, I was returning a rental car in Lyon, and the gentleman greeted me and said, bonjour. And I said, bonjour. Literally, it sounded exactly like him. And he goes, would you like me to speak English? It, it took him two syllables to know I did not know French. Really? Or was it your outfit? I feel like sometimes us Americans, when we're there, it's like our fashion gives us away. Okay, I'll go with that because I thought my pronunciation was spot on. I was a oh, little bit dad. hungry. But you probably look at your outfit and he's like, American. Shorts, shorts and some <laughs> Chucky e. T converse. That was probably not a good call. <laughs> 
All right, let me get to the pop quiz question that we had on Monday's email blast because we have a winner. The term natural wine is strictly regulated and means what? The answer was D. The term is actually not regulated at all. It's a marketing term. So uh, Alyssa M, who is in the house, actually is present and winners have to be present. She gets 100 points deposited into her loyalty account. Good Brent, job. I see you. Chris, I see you. Dana, see you. Eve, nice to see you. So tonight's topic, oh, and by the way, Brent, you were second. Jim B, you were third. So you guys got to be quick on the draw on Monday. It's the, I think it's the first time Brent's been unseated in about six weeks. Uh, that was a good question, but let's get to the subject matter at hand. Many of us have been to Napa or Sonoma or actually pretty much any wine region. And you sit down and you get, you, you wax poetic about being in the vineyards and you're drinking wine, tasting cheese and talking with the winemaker. And you think to yourself, this doesn't suck. I could probably do this. And then you get that kernel of an idea that says, maybe we should get in the wine. And it's precisely what happened with Brie. And I want to have uh, Brie, before I get to the answer to that question, I want to let Ryan, I'm sorry, Ryan, go ahead. And we featured Ryan, boy, this goes back a ways, we, about eight years ago in 2015, uh, and nothing's changed. Still small production, the wines are spectacular, still amazing vineyard sources, of many of which are their own. But Ryan, bring folks up to speed on kind of the four generations of Hill Family Estate. Yeah, and I just want to say it was such a pleasure running into you and Denise in Naples, which is what spurred this whole SIP opportunity. So, you know, God has yes. a way of working sometimes. But for those of you that aren't familiar with my family and the legacy that we have, it dates all the way back to 1913 in the state of California when my great grandfather immigrated from Croatia to Silicon Valley mm. and he decided to farm apricots. So the year was 1913. He farmed apricots through Prohibition, the Great Depression. My dad and his two brothers were born on the apricot farm in the 1950s. They all learned what a sharp knife was very quickly because they worked on the line, you know, between the ages of five, six, and seven to cut the cots in half, take the pit out, drive them out, and they sold them to the Mariani family. So that was the first generation. Apricot farm. <laughs> and then my uh, grandparents, Bill and Aunt Hill, they moved to Healdsburg and they bought a beautiful little farmstead along the Russian River. For those of you that aren't familiar with Healdsburg, it's roughly 60 minutes in the northwestern uh, direction toward the Pacific Ocean from Napa. And they did apples and prunes. And about 80% of what my dad and his family consumed when they were young at, at that farm came from the land. They raised it or they grew it. And they worked very hard as a family. And what my dad realized early on is that families that farm together usually stick together. And that was very nice. Important. So my dad went over and he uh, went on to Fresno State University, graduated with a degree in plant science and viticulture, and then made his way to 1979, where he started developing vineyard sites for a very wealthy family, the Yeager family. So dad had the knowledge, they had the capital, and the beautiful thing blossomed. Over the next 20 years, dad converted all that raw, raw land into prime uh, vineyard real estate. And along that time, my dad realized there was a lot of wealth coming into Napa, and people were building big, beautiful homes. But a lot of time, the dirt around the home, which was perfect for a vineyard site, was fallow, meaning nothing was planted. So dad saw that as an opportunity. He didn't have the money himself, but he knew he could lease it for far less than what the folks that own it paid for it. So dad started forming lease agreements that were 25 years in length, and all he asked for in return was the first right of refusal. Now, Martin, life changes a lot in 25 years. I mean, Bree, we've known each other as long as Martin and I have been you know, doing the, the oh, seller wow. deals together. 2015, very important year when I met Martin, when I met you. That's a lucky year for you. Very lucky year. <laughs> so, so what happened is as life started changing and his folks wanted to be bought out, dad had the opportunity to do just that, do a lot line adjustment. And that's how Hill Family Estate, the vineyard sites were really born. Dad started taking down the leases as they were expiring or as they wanted to sell without any, without any competition on the open market. And today as a family, we control 150 acres of vineyard site in Napa Valley. 
and that's spread across 12 unique vineyard sites. That is awesome. And the, the most alarming figure or stat heard in that story is that you've known Bree and I since 2015, but it took you until 2023 to introduce us. I'm not certain what to think about that. Right. Eight, I, went eight, on I went on sabbatical. <laughs> It was eight year delayed introduction, but I'm happy we are here tonight. So first of all, that's brilliant by your dad and, and really a stroke of genius. Good luck. And I agree with him that farm or families that farm together, stay together. I grew up on a farm. Uh, my cousins still farm and it, there's always something to do on the farm. It gives you a great appreciation for the land. It gives you a great appreciation for the cyclical nature of life and the seasonality of things so that you tend to slow down. And it's not, <laughs> farming is not instant gratification. So you've got to be patient and you learn that very slowly. Now, Bree, since Brian mentioned that you guys met in 2015, I, I want you, some of us know a little bit about the story. Oh, and by the way, Bree's sister, Nikki, could not be with us this evening because no. she is also an entrepreneur and very, very busy with her show in Nashville, I believe, called Bar Mage Don. Now, who's Don? <laughs> Barmageddon. That's, 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 that's Barmageddon. That's, that's yeah. Barmageddon. That's, that's my fault. That's, uh, thanks, studio, for letting that. me know that. Uh, we're okay, so, that, we're yeah. going to use that. That's a good one. Introduce me to yeah. Nikki. I Tell Nikki I apologize. I don't know who Don is, but Barmageddon on USA Network renewed for its second season and hopefully uh show two with seller angels we can have all three of you on but okay. um, tell me a little bit about you know your childhood where you grew up uh, and just walk us through the life of brie garcia yeah so i was born in san diego california i um very shortly after i was born as in like hours kind of days i guess um i went to a small town outside of san diego called brawley california and if people know agriculture, they'll know the Imperial Valley. Um, it's right by the oh, yeah. border of Mexico. Yeah, so um, it's really where all my family's at is in Imperial Valley. On my Italian side, they live on the U.S. side. And then my Mexican side, a lot of them live in Mexicali. So um, I lived there for a while. And then in third grade, I wanted more opportunity for herself. Um, she came from, and they're still really great, um, a produce growing family. So they're called Majesty. Actually, on my social media today, I was walking into Sunshine Market in St. Helena, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's the watermelons. So it's cool. Literally my favorite market on the planet, by the way. Isn't it the best? I'm obsessed. So good. Um, and so it was so cool to see them unboxing their melons. But my grandfather, he, after World War II, kind of like Ryan's family story, he and his brothers all survived the war, and they were in South Philly, and they were kind of like, you know, we, they had a produce cart and candy store, depression hit, they couldn't do it. So my grandfather was like, why don't we grow our own produce? So they migrated to Southern California, bought land, and now they're a huge uh, produce company. So farming was always in my roots. And, um, and because of the Italian side, so was wine drinking. That was a big thing as well. But I grew up in Arizona. Um, I was an athlete, but I was also really drawn to drama, the arts. And my sister and I, it's really funny. <laughs> We used to, uh, my parents' boxing was so big back in the day. So they'd have boxing parties. And we'd always be like, if there's an intermission or a break, can we please perform for all your friends? And we go <laughs> to the Spice Girls and lip sync for everyone. My parents were always like, these girls are crazy, but we loved performing at a young age. So when I saw the women wrestling on television for WWE, I was blown away. And it was the first time I felt connected to something that just made sense. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're athletic. They tell stories. They're crazy characters. I need to know all about this. And How old were you? Gosh, I had to have been probably 18 at the time. So the wrestling okay. fan, I was a late bloomer to becoming a fan. Um, but to myself, I, you know, I feel like that was a young age for me to kind of figure out something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I never thought it'd be possible to be a female wrestler until... Um, I saw there was this ad that they were looking for female wrestlers. And if anyone watched Glow on Netflix, it was very much the, my story of when, you know, like all of a sudden we're looking for female wrestlers and you go in there not knowing anything. You're like, yeah, sign me up. Let's try to do this. Right. So it was this big audition. My sister and I went in. It was called Diva Search. We weren't <laughs> what they were looking for. Um, they definitely had a certain look in mind and we weren't that, but we really wanted to wrestle. 
So um, my sister was supposed to play pro soccer in Italy. I, at the time, I was going through a lot of um, hard things in my life. We had a kind of a, like a rough upbringing and I dealt with some things in my later high school years. So I was a little bit of a wanderlust. I didn't know what I wanted in life. And um, sure enough, we were like, can we just at least get in the ring, fill this out? So we flew to McDonough, Georgia. They're like, you have three days to audition. Like, let's see if this really works. And it was like, I call it bump at first sight. I hit that mat. It hurt like hell, but I loved it. And that whole week being in McDonough, Georgia, I was just like, this is, I was looking for something like this. And now 17 years later, I signed with WWE. I was 22, signed at 23, and I just left them two months ago. So, you know, my career was 17 years as the Bella Twins, as Brie Bella. Um, in that career, we had two reality shows that were big hits for EV, um, Total Divas, Total Bellas. And I think the great thing um, for us is that we didn't know if the world was ready to see what women wrestlers were all about, and they loved it. Um, and... You know, my sister and I, we've had quite a ride in the entertainment industry. And I think for us, when you watched our reality shows, you could see we had a huge love for wine, <laughs> which is how we met <laughs> Brian. We loved drinking it. And wrestling, you know, we didn't have an off season. So we were constantly traveling all year round. So when we ever got like two to three days off, we'd always fly to Napa Valley. And we started to come out oh, wow. four times a year. And um, it was just our happy place. We'd always stay in Yachtville. Um, we just, I don't know, we'd always love to try new wineries. Wine tasting to us was just like, we're like, whoa, this is heaven on earth. Like you're sitting in nature, getting a good buzz, learning like history. <laughs> and, yeah, it's, um, it's not a hard sell. No, no, not at all. And I think like all everyone on here, we're all huge wine lovers. And like everyone who's on right now, we all sit in wine country and we daydream about the life we can have in wine country. Correct. And make a long story short, when the pandemic hit, my sister and I were like, why don't we live in wine country? It's a happy place. And where were you, where were you living before? In Arizona. I was in. So uh, you went back to Arizona. And then I have a question on the flight to McDonough, Georgia. So you're yeah. 17, 18 years of age. Was was Nikki as gung ho about wrestling as you were? No, no. Okay, so you you dr dragged her along. Yeah, so we were at this time we were twenty one, and okay. um, we so I you know she was she was a little skeptical because she just wasn't familiar with it, so she wanted to really feel it out. But I will say, when we got to McDonough, Georgia, she fell in love with it just as much as I did. And, and did you tell your parents what you were doing and, and say, hey, what oh do you guys goodness. think about this idea? Yes. Everyone thought we were crazy. My mom was like, my mom's a recruiter. So my mom was like, okay, you already dropped out of college. <laughs> You're now going to what? And uh, yeah. I'm going to try it out. My mom was like, which she knew she couldn't. She had to let me kind of just beat to my own drum. And, right. you know, she really let me. And so, <laughs> and my grandfather at the time, he was alive. And he was like, no, you're supposed to be a mother, a wife. Like, what do you mean you're going to go wrestle? And I was like, Papa, Nana, I got this. Like, you just wait and see. That is awesome. Awesome. I, and I love the carefree attitude, the wanderlust, throwing caution to the wind and kind of pursuing a passion. And it's it's something that just, you know, doing the research and following both of you and, and kind of watching and listening to the podcasts and catching up on past episodes from years ago. That is a consistent thread throughout the entire story is you two are fearless. And, and if you want something, you're going to go after it and pursue it. And you, you don't necessarily care about what the outcome is going to be because this is what you want to do. And I think that courage and persistence needs to be rewarded and, and basically highlighted and complimented. So hats off to you on both of you on that. Oh, thank you so much. That means a lot. Now, you, it's funny because you, you literally describe every trip I've ever had to Napa Valley where, and Ryan knows this, people from the Midwest, uh, they're the ones that are driving the convertibles in San Francisco and wine country in January <laughs> because, because they've left Chicago when it's zero. So even if it's 45 or 50 in Napa Valley, the top is coming down. It, it's, yeah. I mean, it's delightful. And every single time I've driven across the Bay Bridge or the Golden Gate Bridge from SFO, 
there is a cathartic feeling that you are coming into wine country and it just does seem like the residue and worry of, of everything that you have been experienced up until that point just sort of washes away. You've got those bucolic hills and then you get into the vineyards and depending upon time of year, there's a lot of grapes on the vines and it, there is a magic to it, a, a tapestry, a romance, a beauty that just touches your soul. And, and you decided to say, hey, why aren't we living in Napa? And, and move. And then I'm curious about what was the epiphany to want to make wine as opposed to just sitting back and drinking it? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because when we decided to move here, um, obviously it's not easy to move into wine country. And I was lucky enough that both my husband and I can be remote. He's a professional wrestler as well. And of course, my sister and I do everything in life. So her husband is a pro dancer on Dancing with the Stars. So he, you know, leaves for like four months a year. And then um, she's in the same boat. So we were lucky to have that. But we also knew coming to wine country, we'd live small, but we'd have bigger hearts. Like, I just can't. Everything you think about when you are drinking your wine in wine country and what you feel, you'll feel it when you live here, too. It's pretty incredible. But we, you know, we are lucky because why wine? I always feel like anything you do in life should be authentic to who you are. So when you have passion in something, you're never selling a product. Instead, you're living it. So my sister and I, when we really thought about becoming entrepreneurs, we were like, well, what's authentic to us? Something we don't have to push. We don't have to sell. Like, we just live. And we are like, this is like every day for us. We're like, so easy. We didn't think it would be possible. Like, my sister and I are very spiritual. So we have our vision boards. Let me tell you, we have everything. But we kind of thought when it was on our bucket list, we thought that would be retirement for us. We thought it'd be more towards the end of our lives, never early on, until this guy. So yeah, we, how, where'd you meet? We met, well, so we were filming Total Divas. So this was before Total Bellas even came about. We were filming Total Divas and the producers, they got us um, this Airbnb in Sonoma. And it was really cute. But they're like, we're going to take you to Yonkville to wine taste at this family owned um, winery. And we we're like, oh, it was me and Renee Young, um, the people on this know wrestling at all. And we were like, for awesome. the record, I, I for the record, I wrestled in high school. Oh, did you wrestle? Does does that thing? I got my ass. I did wrestle? I was gonna say a future match between you and I. I'll come to Naples. <laughs> I'll come to Naples. Please. I can go find my singlet if it matters. I can. <laughs> yes, it does. That's a perfect. No, it does. <laughs> <laughs> but so we um we were filming. We walk in, and this guy is the one who's hosting us. And I feel like we instantly connected, had so much fun, but I think that trip really opened up my eyes to just family owned wineries and everything that goes into this beautiful glass of wine. And then from there we stayed connected. And then my friend group here in Napa just grew. I started to become friends with all of Ryan's friends. So then every time that Nikki and I were coming here, it was always to see him and our other friends and then one day, Ryan just asked us, like, hey, do you want me to make a wine for, and obviously my sister's standing there for you guys. I mean, it was music to our ears. We were like, wait, like now for us? Like, we don't have to be like, you know, retired, like right now. And he literally made our dreams come true. Yeah, it's, um, and Ryan, I don't want you to get a big head, but you, you have <laughs> such, such charisma and such charm and such authenticity uh, there's, there's, you know, you know, the Valley better than anybody. Uh, there's some amazing people there, but there's also, you know, like any industry, there can be some, mm -hmm. some folks that maybe are, are less amazing. Uh, you've been incredible to work with. The family's amazing. I've stopped into the tasting room, even when you're not there. And I, we send people there. You happen to be next door to, you know, a very, very famous eatery that we are also fond of. So that doesn't stink, but uh, yeah, Bree, you, you found a good person to help make the wine. Oh my gosh, I definitely did. And after trying their wine, I remember Renee and I left and we're like, damn, that was really good wine. <laughs> like we felt yeah. like we just got spoiled. So not only did I meet a really great family, but I met really great winemakers as well. Hard to find in Napa because like you said, and it's like any business, sometimes people look at dollar bills. They look at um, all the wrong things. And we were lucky enough in this relationship, we all looked at all the right things. Well, and Ryan, I think that's a, a good segue for kind of where your passion comes in to help people 
grow a brand, get involved in the business, get started, where does that desire come from to help other folks succeed in this industry? Oh boy. Um, so there's a couple different, there's, there's different factors. I think number one, growing up, I, I realized early on, I was always a team sport guy. I need Ryan, just lean a little closer to the mic. Is this better? Oh, much better. Okay. Um, when I was growing up in life, I realized fairly early that I was a team sports guy. Athletics were very important to me. And I found that I enjoyed the camaraderie and the friendships. I grew up in Yonville when it wasn't what it is today. It was a very small farming town. So there were 10 people in my graduating class at six. <laughs> and I just remember going to middle school my first day and encountering gangs or um, older kids that you know had gone through puberty and uh, had confidence, like swagger. And I was this young, skinny kid from Yonville, and um, I love sports, and I got cut from my seventh grade basketball team. And then I practiced, 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 came back and became a starter in eighth grade. But what I realized is that it's really cool to do something as a group and together, like in, in, I worked in restaurants later in life, but I think life, like for me, is about collaboration. And when you collaborate with somebody and you have a shared vision and everyone puts in work and you, have, you share a common goal and you work really, really hard toward getting toward that goal, in my life, Martin, there's no better feeling. Like, like it's like winning a championship. You know, it's, right. you feel you're elated and you're on top of the world. And so for me, I didn't realize until maybe my senior year of high school, the opportunity that I had, because keep in mind, even though dad got started in the seventies, we were always farmers. He always sold his grapes to the Silver Oaks, the Cake Breads, the Stag's Leap, you name it. And it wasn't until I graduated high school and went to my father and said, dad, can we start making wine? The Hill Family Estate as a winery was born. So O1 was our first vintage. So we had many, many years in the world of farming. But what I realized is, hey, number one, I don't know that I want to interact with grapevines. I want to interact with people. And the way to do that was by creating a brand. And when I met Brie and Nikki, they, we, the vibe was on right away. What Brie reminded me, so this is funny. I, I'll never forget she, her attire. And she had these really dark sunglasses on it, and I kind of got like this um, Kardashian vibe a little bit, right? Like she's strikingly beautiful, um, she's fit, and uh, I think it was the dark glasses, dark hair, and I was like, man, this, this, who is this girl, right? And then you get to know this girl, Brie, and you're like, whoa, like heart of gold, like the exterior beauty matches the interior. And she's got a heart of gold. And I knew right away that she was going to be a family person because at the time they didn't have children. I did. But you just get a, a feel from somebody. And so I want right. to work with somebody like that. Super cool. Um, I'm going to come back to that exact thread in a second, but I first want to launch the first of two poll questions. So those of you that have been uh, listening, and uh, I'm, I do have old pictures of me in the singlet from wrestling. So I I'll send those to everyone for Christmas yeah. uh, or mm -hmm. my Mark's, my Mark Spitz speedo from fourth grade when we, everyone had an American flag bathing suit. Just stand uh, up, just stand up. Show us on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's freezing in here. <laughs> All right. So for those of you, how many cases of the Benita Benita Sauvignon Blanc were produced and mission control put a hint. Okay. It's on the bottle. So for those of you that are lucky enough to have, I like Ryan looks at Brie going, how many did we produce? Um, kind of both. So, so we're going to give a, a few it's minutes there. I'm going to have another sip. It's fantastic. So refreshing. So refreshing. Especially after these 90 degree weather we've been having here in Napa in the last couple of days. Well, and it's, it's funny because I think too many Sauvignon Blancs are, are too too much acid. Uh, I, I have nothing against New Zealand Sab Blancs. I love them. Uh, but sometimes everyone overdoes it on the acid. And that actually, that, that hurts after a while. You just can't drink a lot of it. 
Uh, all right, we're going to wrap this up because I see five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> now, I have a bottle in front of me. Ooh. Wow. You did great. We've got some smart people. We're going to test their knowledge. The correct answer is indeed 150 cases. Yeah. So uh, Ryan talked about his farming background and his family's farming background and it's fourth generation Hill family estates. So the second question deals with the farming aspect. And I, I think Ryan was modest with regards to some of the names that he and his family have sold grapes to. You heard Silver Oak, you heard Cake Bread. Uh, it goes on and on and on and on, and which is kind of what we talk about at Cellar Angels. Mass-produced wines are usually buying their grapes from somewhere. They don't all have estate vineyards, and the folks that are growing those grapes are the ones where you want to focus. Uh, this is a perfect example, and I want to talk a little bit more about this. Hill Family Estates grows produce for which famous Napa Valley, Re Napa Valley restaurant? Gott's Roadside. Gott's Roadside, by the way, is famous. Um, oh, amazing. Farmstead, the restaurant at Auberge, the French Laundry, or Mustards. Now, when we wrote this question, we realized that actually could be all of them. <laughs> and, and, and we forgot to put it in all of the above, uh, but uh, that's why our show is not syndicated and is only on Friday nights and a very select few audiences. <laughs> Uh, we're going to give this seven seconds. Sarasota Sipsters, I agree. Finally, a reason to drink. Bring on the singlet. That it would be a wish you do not want to see come true. Uh, four, three, two, one. Okay, so apparently no one thinks Gots has fresh produce. Um, Look at that. They, their fish tacos, by the way, are out of this world. Um, that's all I get at Gots. <laughs> I just get like the burgers and I always get the mahi mahi fish tacos. The fish tacos are amazing. They're, They're amazing, as are the truffle fries, but you do not yeah. want to have truffle fries and then go to a shoot and just be reeking of truffle when you're talking to people. So Ryan, talk to us about the garden and, and the restaurant that you actually have been fortunate enough in producing vegetables for for a long time. I think that ties into our last topic, Martin, because when Bree and Renee came to the tasting room, um, one of the most unique experiences that I think guests can experience when they come to Napa and visit Hill Family or Bonita Bonita is a trip to our culinary garden. And this is a garden that is actually owned, owned and tended to by my godparents. They're both in their 70s. Uh, my godfather, Peter Jacobson, he's a master gardener. They never had children. So growing up across the street, when I say the street, it's a dirt road with gravel on top. Um, they have an acre and a third. My family had an acre. On the weekends, especially, my parents would just shepherd me over there and say, hey, we need a little break from the kids. Why don't you go hang with Peter and Winnie? And so through tribal wisdom, they taught me the art of organic farming and how important it is to know where our food comes from and what we put into our bodies. So this was long before we are where we are today in America. They were big on this back when it wasn't a fad and it wasn't cool and it wasn't being talked about. Um, well, Thomas Keller opened the French Laundry, or I should say took it over from the Schmidt family in 1994. He was buying produce from time to time from my godparents. And then in 2000, they decided to form an exclusive. And my uh, godfather has always been a dentist in San Francisco. So they would spend their weeks in San Francisco and then come up to the Yonville house on the weekends. And what they realized is that they wanted to collaborate with other chefs other than just Thomas Keller. So the answer to your question, they, they do sell to other accounts now, um, but the French Laundry was an exclusive buyer for many, many years. And so, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I took Bree and Renee to this garden, and I think it has a pretty significant impact on people. You can go to, like, time. see the barrels at wineries. You can see the tanks. But after that two or three times, you're ready for something new. And when you're walking around on dirt, you're tasting organic produce, you're under uh, a bluebird sky, surrounded by 120 different types of fruit trees. That's a memory. One, like, yeah. have us try the edible flowers and certain things and then it started making me realize like oh this is why the French laundry that's this on this and that and that and uh, it's an incredible it's a special place 
special. No, and it's 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 actually another testament to you and the family because, and you're right, you, you were caring for the land in an organic fashion before organic caring was in vogue. And there's, you know, and, and the, most of the farmers that we work with, they've been farming this way for years. Uh, it's just a great way to take care of the soil, take care of the, of the vines. You don't drown them in glyphosate and pesticides and things like that. You work with the natural ecosystem of the environment. You have the ground cover that's going to be helpful with the nutrients and the nitrogen and stuff like that. And you know all this. And the irony is, is that if, if you were labeled or had an organic classification in the 90s, you were on the bottom shelf somewhere tucked away in the back of a wine store because it just wasn't popular. In fact, those are still the best wines. And it's a not everybody has a CCOF organic label because that's not inexpensive to pursue. But the folks that are making organic wines, just like going to the farmer's market, you can taste the difference. You can see the difference. I mean, you look at that produce and you look at the color of the yolks and the eggs and, and the color of the, the heirloom tomatoes and stuff like that. It's night and day. And it just impacts the way the flavors come out and, and how well it's received on the table. So hats on for being, I, I hesitate to use the word pioneer because you were doing it long before it was very popular. Uh, super cool. And, and fun fact, never seen the garden. So apparently that's uh, that's on a you know that's VIP my... list or something. Never eaten at the French Laundry. Apparently you might be able to get me a table. Um, I have to remedy both of those things in my lifetime. Done. Yes, done, and done. done and done. Done and done. All right, let's, uh, Mission Control is going to turn on some cameras. Hopefully no one other than myself is wearing a singlet. Mm -hmm. um, Brie, I want to get with you on why the varietals you and Nikki chose. You, you mentioned you used to come up to Napa quite often, you know, fly up every chance you got type of stuff. And I'm familiar with that travel routine. Uh, what resonated with you? What's the passion for some of the varietals you chose? Well, you know, it's really interesting because Nikki and I are really big in reds. Like we love full body cabs. Uh, we like red blends. And this is all before kids. Um, we are just red wine drinkers. So, I mean, obviously there's no better place to have red wine than in Napa Valley. So um, I think that was a big reason we were drawn. I mean, not only the beauty, everything, but all our favorite wines were here. And then it was interesting because I feel like um, when we started to have kids and just so many different things, we were starting to get into a lot of white. And rosé was always like a fun thing with like our girls. But when it came to deciding what wines we wanted Bonita Bonita to have, Nikki and I we were just like, at the time we'd always say it had to be Bella approved, but it has to literally be Brie and Nikki approved. Like if we don't sell what we don't drink, we only like all of this is because it's something that our palates love and that we truly drink. I don't want to say on a daily basis, but um, you know, <laughs> but, okay. we but my it, sister, it's, you're yeah, safe, you're we, safe, you're in the cone of silence, Brie. <laughs> But I will tell you, like, my palate changed a little bit when I started to have kids. And I actually laughed when people were like, Chardonnay is such a mom wine. And when I had kids, I'm like, I get it. And it's, you know <laughs> what happened, too, is you started, I started to drink wine during the day. I didn't do that before kids. But I'm like, oh, my gosh, I get it, having kids. So there was just, like, it, you know, um, I think, like, everyone you evolve um, in life, which means also you evolve with the way you drink wine. and. That's how kind of Nikki and I choose different. Martin, I also right. wanted to add one thing. All these wines are uh, from vineyards that Hill Family Estate cares for. Yeah. And they're crafted by uh, the Hill Family Estate winemaker, Allison Doran, who is celebrating her 50th year of making wine 5 0 this year. And so while Nikki, Bree, and I constantly meet with Allison and lend guidance on which direction we want to head stylistically, um, it, it it was one of these things where it's like we sat down had a powwow and said this this is on the board these are the varieties and we we went that direction and i think what i really appreciate as a partner in bonita bonita is they had many 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 opportunities with walmart target total wine to buy bulk wine i think the biggest purchase order was ninety thousand cases of wine that if we produce that, Walmart was willing to take a look at it and stock the shelves. But Brie and her sister didn't like the wine. 
So they turned down what would have been a significant payday because of the emphasis that they have on quality. Right. It's true. And it goes back to just being authentic to who you are. You know, yep. I don't want to sell something I don't love. And so, but Allison is someone that when you come to Napa, you have to meet. Oh. She is a gem. She's a modern day Julia child. Allison I mean, is legit. Crazy. She's, well, oh, I have there's, stuff. there's, um, I mean, tenure of Napa Valley winemakers within single houses or single domains or single wineries it probably is an average of seven to 10 years. To have someone uh, producing wine for 25 years or 30 years or 50 years, 50 years making wine is, is simply, it, it defies logic, defies the odds. It's incredible. And, and that's, I think, to what Ryan talked about earlier. It's a testament to family. It's a testament to values. It's a testament to kindness, taking care of your employees. And, and again, another point in if the family that farms together stays together. And Allison, probably not related, but feels like family because she's been doing it for so long. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if your children call her Aunt Allison or something to that effect, because I, I grew up in an Irish Catholic family with a lot of aunts and uncles that I didn't realize weren't related until my teens. So, um, but yeah, it, exactly. The Italians know all about that. Um, so that's cool. And, and uh, Brie, I love the fact that you again with the authentic theme going I, i'm not we're not going to produce something that i don't love and that i'm not drinking so uh i i'm you know I, I don't know anything about albarino i don't care if it's commercially hot product right now i haven't had it so i'm not going to produce it i drink sauv blancs i drink big red wine so let, let's go with those um i do want to hear more about the the lack of day drinking until motherhood what happened there uh, most of us are profound day drinkers, certainly as a result of the pandemic. I mean, I I've known her before. Right. She was no, I was day drinking. I think as I was on the road with wrestling five days a week. Um, so when you'd have your like glass of anything, it would always be after a wrestling show, which a wrestling show ended at like 10 p.m. So right. you know, a full body cab, just like the palate, so great after that. But definitely, like, you know, when we have our two days off, I would, rosé was a big thing, or bubbles, right? Always into champagne. And, Always. And we have actually delicious um, Blanc de Blanc uh, sparkling wine. But I will say, I think with, when I became a mom, I slowed down a lot, um, just being out of the ring and everything. And um, I started enjoying, like, you know, more of, like, um, like getting into mom groups and and so it started to become a fun thing. We do play dates and like someone was busting out either a Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc. So I started to like educate myself, like, well, what kind of Chardonnay do I like? And I was like, oh, I like a little butter, a little like French oak. Like, you know, I didn't want like the super buttery ones, but I didn't like ones that had no butter. Like, so I, I that's when I really started to like dive into it. And that's, that's, in my opinion, I think the educational process is more than half the fun. It's, yes. you've got, you've got a veritable spice rack there in Napa Valley. You can choose, like you just mentioned, French oak, new oak, uh, neutral oak, stainless steel. You can just go on and on and on until you find that magic formula that says, okay, that's the one I want to make. Mm -hmm. And when you have Ryan assisting with that, it, I mean, it's, it's a no brainer and we're, we're happy for it. Now let's talk about this Sauvignon Blanc and we're going to, um, I'm going to pour myself more. Yes. You want to pour so some? let's let's do aromas, aromas, flavors, and pairings. And there's traditional Sauvignon Blanc pairings, but I'm going to challenge you to give us some uh, Latina influence. Yes, I can't wait to tell anyone. Just a little bit. <laughs> you were going to think I'm crazy, but so when when. And some of the folks have already commented in the chat that there are way too much predominant acidic Sav Blancs on the market, and they do get very difficult to drink after a while. I mean, it's really hard to have five or six glasses of acidic Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, right. I'm not saying that that's the norm, but um, what Sauvignon Blanc were you after? Do you want me to? Yeah. Um, okay. So um, I think for Bree's taste and you know, she mentioned her palate has changed, but we tasted a um, array of different sites. And Martin, I know I sent you where these uh, the vineyards are for this one, but I think what I found is that three is less of that high tone citrus, grapefruity, 
laser sharp acidity, tap key, um, <laughs> re reduction, oh, reduction, really reduction in a in a in a bottle, no, in a glass. It tastes reduced sometimes, and so. Um, what I did is, is we sat down and we tasted different blocks together. And so this Sauvignon Blanc is not specific to one site. This comes from three different vineyards. It's also three different clones. The majority of this wine is made from the Sauvignon Musquet clone, which lends itself more to stone fruit and lychee. And then you have an Italian clone and, uh, and the addition of clone one. And clone one has more of that grassy, um, it's an iconic Napa Valley clone that's been uh, planted for many, many years. But the other thing is that they're not from the same elevation. We have Hillside, about 1,500 foot elevation is one of the sites. We've got 1,200 foot elevation right above uh, Jarvis and Kenzo Estate in the Wooden Valley. And then if you go into American Canyon uh, at our Watson Vineyard, it's on a 30% slope you think Billy goats are running up and down this hill all day, but we, we decided to grow Sauvignon Blanc. And these are the grapes that dad has traditionally sold to Quintessa Vineyards. They make a wine called Illumination. And so what we decided to do to avoid um, a lot of that razor sharp acidity is just delay picking. So we waited until the bricks level jumped up a little bit and it created more of a waxy, uh, almost like this moat of flavor on your palate that sits. And has a medium to maybe longer finish than most Sauvignon Blancs. It's also uh, the uh, the lychee you talked about. There's a very nice tropical undertone. Great. It, and I would mean, uh, yeah, that tropical Martin is uh, it's all Muscat clone. Mm. I'm gonna um, before Jeff Greasy kills me, I'm going to go to Google Earth uh, because people want to know where these vineyards are. Uh, his his last name technically isn't greasy he works at a mechanic factory uh he just is always covered in motor oil he's very greasy you know my dad on his wedding day because he was a mechanic um i mean my parents have been divorced for a while but you see like my they're holding hands and he has a grease all over his hands because he had to work that day <laughs> on his wedding day i love it on his wedding day my mom was like and you say when you see him putting on the ring so i'm um, me think about it so, so the Cellar Angels playground is uh, Napa. Well, we'll go down to Napa County. Is is Napa and Sonoma? Whoa, that was quick. Wow. So this gives you an idea of where Napa is and where Sonoma is. And uh, boy, we we showed you the pictures early on of Hermitage, and you saw the Rhone River. And I've mentioned this for fifteen years in wine education. Every single great wine region in the world has a maritime influence. Napa and Sonoma are no different. And as a matter of fact, they have some of the most maritime influences. You've got the San Pablo Bay, you have the Pacific, you've got the Russian River Valley, you have all these lakes and tributaries here. Every single one of them influences the microclimate. Uh, it's, an, it's an amazing tapestry for winemaking. Uh, we talked, Brian mentioned a couple different vineyards for the Bonita Bonita Sauvignon Blanc. One of them is Stewart Ranch. Another one is that one and that one. So we'll zoom in to give you an idea. So here's Stewart Ranch. Literally, Ryan, if I'm correct, is it this block right here or this vineyard? Yeah, so that, by the way, um, you're tasting history in a glass. This is the lowest lying vineyard site in the entire Napa Valley. It's actually well, on Highway 29. It's at sea level. Yeah, it's interesting because when I was preparing this earlier, you know, you have the river right here. Yeah. And you can just you can just tell all of this at one point in time was was or is marshland through tremendous amounts of flooding and the river overflowing its banks and receding, overflowing its banks and receding. And with all of that over hundreds of thousands of millions of years comes a tapestry of soil types in here. But why did dad think this was gonna be a good spot for vines? So it's uh, dedicated, that vineyard site is mainly Pinot Noir that we sell to mom for their bubbly. Uh, we use a little bit that we vineyard designate under the Stewart Ranch uh, label. We also have the first ever planting of Albarino at the site in Napa Valley. The year was 1997. So that's a good quiz question. When did Al you talked about Albarino earlier, Martin? 
The year was 1997. It was grown exclusively for Michael Havens of Havens Wine Cellars. We now make our own Albarino at Hill Family, not at Bonita yet. And then you that's have, hysterical. And by the way, that wasn't a plant. I just was naming Albarino off the cuff. I'm a big fan. So that's hysterical. I love that you have it. <laughs> so, um, and this was an old glider port. So Bucky Stewart, who was a sheriff of Napa County, had a, had a, a glider and he would launch and land at this site. So this is an old cow pasture. So, you know, it's uh, fertilized naturally. It's got a lot of clay in the soil because it's carneros. There is a little bit of saltwater intrusion coming off that Napa River. The Army Corps of Engineers many years ago when they built the floodplain down there, uh, they put up a berm surrounding the vineyard, but they didn't key it in, meaning that water can get under the berm as opposed to just going over because usually you have to key it in to prevent any saturation. So this vineyard is like the law of diminishing returns. Every year we get lower and lower yields because the salinity in the soil starts to kill the vines and make it harder and harder. Uh, so you're talking to a true farmer because I can honestly tell you that this is a lost leader for my father. <laughs> this vineyard costs more to farm than we can sell the grapes for per acre. All right, let's move on to another vineyard then that has a little bit more <laughs> better economic story. Yeah. No, but it's a quality story, Martin, because he loves it. Where are we here? That is American Canyon. That's the Watson Vineyard. So that's the gateway to the Napa Valley. So uh, American Canyon, you know, you're starting, Martin, you said when you get on the Bay Bridge or the Golden Gate, you start to, you know, get, get the good feels that you're almost to wine country. I think for a lot of folks, this is when you start to see vineyard when you cross the Bay Bridge as opposed to the Golden Gate. And uh, this, is, this is a site, you, you know, you mentioned the maritime climate. Uh, America this area. It's not in Appalachian, but it's a growing area in all of Napa Valley. Um, so when wind blows over nine miles an hour, the little stomates that open and close on the bottom of a grapevine, they shut and the vine will physiologically shut down from growing. So we get really nice hang time here. We do Syrah, we do Pinot Noir, we do Chardonnay, and of course the Sauvignon Blanc. And this is really the backbone to what the winemakers, because there's been a couple since dad has been selling to Quintessa, say just offers so much depth and complexity. And I lend it to the hang time that the grapes get. And here's the uh, Napa airport where uh, Jeff usually flies into and you know <laughs> st standard operating procedure for the greasies. Um, all right, let's go. We've got a little bit of time left to do the origin. Yeah. And, and Bree, I want you to chime in on the red wine as well, because you mentioned that you are a big red wine drinker. Yeah. And, um, uh, oh, Bree, before I go on, on the Sav Blanc, killer pairing recipes. Oh, yes. So, yes. So everyone's going to think I'm a little crazy, but I'm not. Uh, or maybe you already do. But so then this just adds to my craziness. Um, so my sister and I, especially during um, spring and summer, something we love to do to our Sauvignon Blanc is we put sliced jalapenos in it. Um, if you're a fan of spicy margaritas or any type of spicy cocktail, this will do it as well. Um, we love it. And we also do it to the Bonita Bonita Rosé. But I'm not even kidding you. It doesn't ruin your wine. Look at someone. Oh, Dana does it. So you do a rosé. Um, it doesn't ruin your wine at all. It just adds a certain flavor. And when you're sitting by a pool, you're just, mm, it's perfect. My lips start to burn, but it pairs really well with <laughs> fish tacos. Um, you know, today, earlier, we uh, had this beautiful cut of striped bass. It was pan seared. And the um, Sauvignon Blanc paired really well with that. Um, you know, seared sea scallops because it does have weight and texture. So if you're not a Chardonnay lover, um, I think it complements, uh, you know, something like that or halibut even. Um, well, when, the, when the kids- If we talked fish tacos at Gots, this wine would be fantastic sitting out in the back, you know, at a picnic table with some fish tacos exactly. over there. And I feel like all of us winos, we always like to have fun with our wine and like we have little wine gatherings. And I feel like when you guys have people over, dare them to like, Slice up jalapeno and have them throw it in their Sauvignon Blanc. 
And I'm not even kidding you. My sister and I do it to everyone. No one's ever disappointed. They're always like, kind of like, wait, what? Like, it's weird. How, how much How much of a jalapeno? The Irish aren't very good with peppers. No. Just put the whole thing in there. No. Oh, damn. I slice it really thin, and I put like two. Okay. Don't, don't do too much. My lip, my lip starts to sting a little bit because maybe I'm a weak lane. I don't have the wet teeth. The a gringo. Yeah. A gringo. <laughs> But um, yeah, just a simple garnish, just okay. like laundry does with their flowers, like simple in your, but it's really nice. All right, Ryan, we're going to go throw some vineyards for origin up here. Yeah, throw the vineyards up. I'll talk a little bit about the wine. So this is almost a Bordeaux blend. We just add Petit Syrah. Allison loves uh, Petit Syrah and Malbec. This actually has a bit of Malbec in it. Um, origin, by definition, is where something starts. For us, it's always been family. So this was the wine, the inaugural wine that we launched Hill Family Estate Winery with back in 2001. And stylistically, we're, we're looking for bouncy red, crunchy red, ripe fruit. It generally encompasses a lot of fruit from the valley floor and a little right. bit from the hillsides. We find that our hillside fruit can be a bit more tannic. And we uh, like to blend that more with our Cabernet Sauvignon. However, That's I so think, good. you know, we don't throw a lot of new wood on this wine in terms of our oak regimen. Um, and we're looking for something that has approachability, but also ageability. Well, and I think it's interesting, you mentioned valley floor fruit and, you know, you're looking on the outskirts of Napa right here down in the southern part of the screen. And so you're right there. Is that um, Terra, Martin? What's that? Is that Terra Vineyard? No, it was... Which one is Here, that? Here's um, Corley family, Monticello's house up yeah. here. So yeah, that's Bo Ranch. That's Bo Terre. Oh, okay. So the, uh, uh, the Merlot from that site and the cab has gone to the Duckhorns for many years. And, and so, um, you know, back when dad was selling grapes, he loved that site because back in the day, there was a blue line stream that no longer exists on a topographical map. But... Um, the uh, back range, the Eastern Mountain Range, had this stream that kicked off the mountain and deposited a lot of rock and shale many, many years ago into that site where that pin is for Origin One. And so even though it's a Valley Four property and you would think that it has a high water holding capacity with all that rock blended in with the soil, it actually builds, it's like built-in drainage. Right. So we get exceptional, exceptional uh, fruit quality with low yields because the vines get more stress right there than other areas in the valley floor that have a higher water holding capacity. Oh, I did Stewart Ranch, didn't I? Why do I have this one? Oh, no, I don't. Oh, yeah. Is... There was the Merlot from Stewart as well for the origin. All right. There was one that I don't see. That, oh, don't tell me I didn't save that one. That one is amazing. God, I suck at this. Um, I don't think you do. Hang on, Ryan. There was one over here. Does uh, that help? Baker, Atlas Peak, or Windy Flats. Windy Flats. Windy Flats, yes. What's the address on Windy Flats? Anybody have that off the top of their head? Uh, it do, was, you really, uh, do you want me to find it really quick? Oh, here it is. Okay. So, 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 guys, fellow sisters, this place is super cool. So, look at those cliffs. Those cliffs dump fog. If you've ever watched a Guinness beer cascade into a, into a glass, that's you're talking to an Irish guy. I watched that at breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> so, Martin, imagine your breakfast uh, going down this hillside and cascading and just shooting out over the vineyard, hence the name Windy Flats. But the Cabernet Sauvignon from the site has been the number one selling wine to the uh, Wagner family for their famous special select. Wow. No way. Yeah. Look at that, that's yeah. So That, that gives you, a, that oh, gives you a good perspective of, of this cliff right here because I can totally see and envision the fog just coming right down um, and just blanket in these vines. Uh, Martin, there's days I can't wear a ball cap in the vineyard because it's so intense it knocks it off my head. My dad likes to wear one of those brim caps 
He cannot wear it at this venue. Is that where we picked up the little yeah. boys? Okay. Oh, there's a great photo that you shared on Instagram yeah. where we harvested. It's my dad, Landon, Ray, Nikki, and the boys. And the that little was boys. at Wendy Flats. And we did, yeah. Nikki and I did a lot of social media on Bonita Bonita and ours, and the, like all our boys picking, and that's there. But it was super windy. So, Martin, see yeah, where that's you're playing? Yep. So it goes all the way up the hill, hillside. So here's the deal. The planted vineyard there is only 20 acres. However, the site that we own, the amount of land, is 130 acres. Wow. The reason we can't develop anymore is that Napa County has an ordinance where you cannot develop over a 30% slope. And because we butt up against the hillside, it's off limits. You could harvest this flat part down here and weave it in and round out that average. Um, those trees and the environmentalists would find us. I don't mind that. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I have to say just because I feel like Ryan doesn't understand how crazy it is when they do, um, when it comes to harvest and picking, but he'll and always like throw out the invitation to call and I'm like, hey, at 2 a.m., we're going to go pick. Hey, at 4 a.m. And I'm always like, game. But there is such a te technique and the, how fast they go. I'm not kidding you. When I'm out there, even your son landed, how oh, he's 11, how good he is now, I mean, way better than me. It is incredible when you see them all out there. And I did it where I did your guys' 4 a.m. hour one time, and I'm out there, and I'm picking, and I'm really slow, but they're all incredible. When the sun came out, I looked down at all these white spiders on my gloves. I freaked out. <laughs> gentle right they're like not harmless or they're harmless but um it's really amazing to see their family and they do it as a family and that's why like ryan's always like bring your kids out and to see like all oh, his kids out there and then i we brought our boys and buddy and mateo who are two and a half years old they did they not love when you got it they love to grab the grapes and throw them in the um what do you call it the tray oh the, the bin <laughs> The yes. Yeah. And when you guys do, is it press? Yes. We were here and it was Allison, the winemaker, her son, her husband, Ryan, and then Allie, Allie. who you guys all know. Oh, but... somebody asked about Allie. Um, Allie uh, manages uh, our, our DTC channels. Yes. So you see them all here as a family. Everyone's doing it. And then Nikki and I are always like, we need to join. But it is incredible harvest. If you yeah, know about it... here, their whole family. 24-7. It's, it's hard work. And um, by the way, if you're not following Benita Benita on Instagram, you're missing out because, and Brian does an amazing Wine Wednesday tip uh, every single Wednesday that is okay. spot on with the intellect and very valuable tips from a wine perspective. Uh, now, Bree, we're going to get to the hard part, the essay questions. Oh, I don't have to answer, right? <laughs> you do. I, I, okay, so <laughs> Bree and Ryan, you've got one coming up. Uh, what would you tell your 21 year old self that you now know today? Wow. Well, for me, the one thing I tell my 21 year old self is don't be afraid of your voice. Um, I think at 21, we all lack confidence. And I think one thing is like, well, there's all these things we want to say that we keep in here and we're just too scared to voice it. And when I started to use my voice, and say things, I realized I was like, wait a second, this is actually doing great things for me. And even if it went against me, it was okay. It's what I felt. And not everyone's going to believe in what I believe in. But I would tell my 21 year old self to say it. Don't, because there were so many times I walked away from meeting, from even a group of friends, if I didn't say my opinion. So many times I'd lose sleep and I'm like, oh, why didn't I just say that? I just tell myself, say it. Don't lose sleep, just say it. I like it. I like it a lot. Okay, Ryan, you're a question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Living or dead, who is one person you would like to share a glass of your family's wine with? Ooh, that's actually, that's a really amazing question. Wow, living or dead. I'm curious to know. Oh, living or dead. It's only an hour program. Uh, because we're, we're cut short on time and the person, no, you're good. The person that comes to my mind is, uh, my grandmother on my dad's side. 
because she told me at a young age, you don't want to get in, you don't want to be in the farming industry. It's too hard. And it's 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 a lot of work and you need to you need to finish and go get your college degree. And so she wasn't around long enough to see what we created. Mm -hmm. And I think that it would make her extremely proud to see that we're still farming. And we've, we've introduced wine to the family legacy. And then speaking of tasting wine, and I think that's a, both of those are great pieces of one is kind of a romantic wish. And the other one, Brie, I think is fantastic wisdom to, to just speak up. Uh, yeah. throw caution to the wind, say your voice, don't, don't, you know, push your voice down. I, th I wish more people did that. Um, how do people come taste Brie, Bonita Bonita or Hill Family Estate? So both, you can go to Hill Families Tasting Room in Yonkville, and then they also have a winery. So we're looking at- We're the at the winery. Yeah, right now we're at- two there. locations. Yeah, and um, and Bonita Bonita is looking for their own spot, but you know it's always you know wine country. We all work on slow time, so it's a work in progress. But the nice thing is, is that you know you just contact Ryan Hill and their family, and you can do a Bonita Bonita tasting, and you know Nikki and I will pop in. We're always around. Doing yeah, and stuff. by the way, if you have ever eaten at or want to eat at Bistro Janty in Yountville, my favorite the Hill family, the Hill family tasting room is right next door. So, um, we're, we're, to, to interrupt really quickly, though, for all the sisters that are on right now, I think number one is if any of you have plans to visit wine country, go through Martin uh, and Martin email me, and we will take exceptional care of them. Uh, yeah. Maria or myself, Maria, Maria's a lot busier than I am just with, with what she has going. Um, but I would love to change your last name to Hill or Bonita Bonita for yeah. the day and, and show you what we do here. It's been great time together. Um, several of the angels will be out in June. We will see you then. June what? Uh, uh, June, June, first week in June, like uh, three through eight. Are we here? We're here. We're both here. Yeah. Boom. I, I like that. Are we here? We're here. I know. I'm like, mm. <laughs> yeah, we're here. Yeah. We're here. Don't, don't, don't. Hey, J and J, I saw that look. We're Everything's ready. good. Um. I want to thank our guests this evening who have put up with uh, the Sipsters, the host especially, and really allowed us a deeper exploration of two amazing labels. Benita Benita is, uh, I'm going to get more of it. I, if those of you who want this SB, it's on the Cellar Angels website. You can order it from the Benita Benita website. I would encourage you to join the wine club there so that you have access to all of the portfolio. Uh, Hill Family Estates just continues to produce exceptional wines after exceptional wines. And, and Ryan's not name dropping when he's telling you the customers that his father and family have had for decades. It's basically because of the fruit and the way they farm and how they take care of their customers. Uh, so when you have the Duncan family, uh, you know, of Silver Oak and Duckhorn and Quintessa and on and on and on, it's a testament to the way you're doing things. And, and that is something that we cherish here at Cellar Angels. I hope you had fun. As we like to say here, we drink serious wines. We just don't take ourselves too seriously. So I love uh, it. I feel like I'm a sipster now. I'm a sipster. You are a sipster. Hey. <laughs> uh, now, this may come as a surprise. We're not going to be on next week. I, I know it seems like we've had a lot of PTO. It's sweeps week, and we don't have a good program. But we're going to be on in two weeks, and we will have the Hursleys that are also right up the road in Yountville. And we're going to be talking winery dogs because you can't have a winery without a dog. I think there's an unwritten law. Uh, and they've got one of the most famous dogs in the Valley. So in two weeks, angels come back. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you so much for your support. And remember, if you've got an opportunity for kindness, take it. See you in two weeks. Bree and Ryan, thank you so much. Loved meeting you. Can't wait to see you in the flesh. Uh, be good to everyone. Cheers. See you in June. See you in June. See you in June. Salute.